Hey folks, so glad that you could uh, join us this day. Uh, just a few brief announcements before we get going. Again, a big thanks to all the folks who collaborated with one another to make this worship service possible. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Next week, uh, the fourth Sunday of Advent, Sunday, December 20th, will be our annual service of Lessons and Carols. It will be another um, pre-recorded service like this. Uh, so uh, join us next week for a service with lots of extra music, and we hope that you will join us. Uh, this is a difficult time of year. It's a difficult time of year for many within what for most of us has been an extraordinarily difficult year. Uh, so to give voice to that, we are going to be having a uh, what, what we're calling the longest night of the year service, which will be on December 21st, the winter solstice, the longest night of the year. And it will be a time for us to gather um, and to express um, our pain, our loss, our grief, our struggle with everything that's going on in the world right now, and to share that with one another while simultaneously um, dreaming for a better day and trusting in God's capacity um, for salvation and, and redemption and, and newness. So we invite you to join us. It's not going to be a pre-recorded service. It's going to be um, a live service via Zoom. Uh, I will, uh, I'll send out details later on um, this week. We've, I felt that because of the, the, the tenor of, of that particular worship service, it would be best not to have it pre-recorded and would be best to, to do it live on Zoom so that we could at least see each other face to face. So we invite you to join us again Monday, December 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Doesn't matter where you are, uh, you, you can join us. Um, and uh, finally, we continue to pray for Bob Miller. Uh, Bob Miller, as of... Um, the recording here today on Saturday. Um, Bob Miller is still uh, at Central Baptist recovering from both bronchitis and uh, COVID-19. I spoke with Marcy earlier today and uh, progress is, is being made uh, and uh, likely they uh, he will have to do some sort of, of rehab at a place like Cardinal Hill or someplace uh, else uh, as he can, you know builds back the strength of his lungs and gets his oxygen rates um, you know, back to where they need to be. So uh, please continue to pray for Bob and his recovery and all folks around this country um, that are, um, that are uh, struggling with, with COVID-19. Um, continue to be vigilant, wear a mask, um, stay home if you can, and uh, help us to bear one another's burdens so that we can get through this together. All right, folks, let's worship. Um, but before Isaac leads us in our poetry prayer and Lydia leads us in our prelude, let's breathe together. Let's breathe in God's mercies and breathe out God's mercies to others. Breathe in God's mercies and breathe out God's mercies to others. And finally, breathe in God's mercies and breathe out God's mercies to others. Dear friends, let us worship God. If I wanted to sow joy, I wouldn't use words. I would turn the music all the way up and push the table against the wall until we had room to dance. I would roll the windows down and drive you out of town until fresh air filled your lungs. I would squeeze your hand and look you in the eye so that you would know you are not alone. I'd lay down the picnic blanket and we'd look at the stars so that nothing could separate you from God's great beauty. I'd open my door like Elizabeth did for Mary. I'd tell you to stay as long as you'd like. Make yourself at home. What's mine is yours. And maybe we'd sing and maybe we'd laugh. And maybe it would be enough to be in the presence of God and each other. If I wanted to sow joy, that's what I'd do. So sing me your song. We've got dancing to get to.
Once upon a time, there was a little girl who had a terrible day. She left her lunch at home, she skinned her knee on the playground, and no one wanted to sit with her on the bus. As she sank into her mother's arms at the end of the day, her mother said, Honey, what was the best part of today? The little girl cried and said, Nothing. The entire day was terrible. So the mother got down on one knee, wiped away her tears, and said, There is always some good. Sometimes we just really have to look for it. The little girl looked up at her mom and said, What is good about today? And the mother said, For starters, you're here in my arms. Friends, any time we gather together to worship God, we are here in God's arms. So may we recognize that gift, and in doing so, may we sow joy. Let us worship holy God. I dream of dance parties in the kitchen. I dream of laughter that is contagious. I dream of birthday candles and another beautiful year. I dream of family game nights and dinner parties with friends. I dream of homemade Halloween costumes and homemade family recipes. I dream of pillow forts, fireflies, and front porch swings. I dream of every little thing that brings joy and I know it comes from God. So today, we light the candle of joy as a reminder that God's dream for this world involves the end of all tears. God's dream for this world involves a joy that overflows and a contagious. So may this fire burn bright, and as it does, may we sing. May we dance. May we laugh. May we, we, may we hold on to people we love. May we sow joy in a hunt, hurting world, 
and may it be an act of holy resistance. Amen. Amen. and new wrongs wear ruts throughout our lives and relationships. But God is able to restore us like water coursing through a desert. The waters of baptism flow through us, reminding us what we belong to God, and we are raised to new life. O oh, great writer, with a sky full of stars and a world full of flowers, there should be no end to my joy. And yet, instead of decorating my very being with joy, I let it slip away like loose change. Instead of singing like Mary or dancing like David, I pass by remarkable beauty and love most days unfazed. Forgive me. Teach me the ways of children who laugh and dance and sing as if joy is the very thing that keeps them alive. Maybe they have joy figured out. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. In Jesus Christ, the Lord has done great things for us. Even if we have gone out in tears, God brings us home shouting for joy. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. for illumination. Creator God, scripture is flooded with dreamlike images. The lion lying down with the lamb, justice rolling like a mighty river, swords being beaten into plowshares, the prisoner being set free, good news to the oppressed, the whole world rejoicing. To our human ears, there are times when these words can sound like nothing more than a far off dream downplaying prophecy to fantasy. However, what we know is that to dream is to hope, and to hope is to imagine, and to imagine is to wonder, and to wonder is to believe, and to believe is to live and breathe for your promised day. So give us the strength to listen as we dream, O oh God, for deep down, we know your words are the very thing we need. Amen. Our first scripture is Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. 
Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Second scripture. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities. The devastation of many generations. For the Lord, for I the Lord love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The third scripture is taken from the first chapter of Luke, verses 46 through 55. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, 
and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he has made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. There's so much sorrow here, so much shame and hurt and fear. And this grief feels like the ache is never ending. The night is long, can't find sleep. It's time to dream fierce dreams Like Mary did Brave dreams Like Joseph did New dreams Like Jesus did Cause those who dream change everything Those who dream change everything Today is Gaudetta Sunday, Gaudetta being the Latin word for joy or rejoice. But most of us know it as simply that Sunday in Advent when we light that pink candle. Like Lent, the season of Advent has a rather 
deliberately penitential feel to it. So this Sunday, when we light the pink candle, serves as kind of a break to allow us to dwell on joy, to dwell within joy. And more specifically, the joy that we find in the nearness of God's creation as we anticipate the birth of Christ. This Sunday is always a good time to remind ourselves of the difference between happiness and joy. For example, uh, the creme brulee latte that I had at Starbucks yesterday made me happy. But I find joy in my daughter, Hazel Grace. I was happy last week when my Kansas Jayhawks beat the Kentucky Wildcats. I promise that's all the gloating I'm going to allow myself. But I find joy singing hymns with other people, something I miss a lot these days. And finally, the smell that comes from my cast iron skillet when I saute onions and garlics for a soup or something else, that makes me happy. But enjoying a meal with my family or close friends brings me joy. So I wonder how would you define the difference between happiness and joy? The Dutch Catholic theologian and author Henry Nouwen says the following on the topic. He said, joy is not the same as happiness. We can be unhappy about many things, but joy can still be there because it comes from the knowledge of God's love for us. Joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. It is a choice based on the knowledge that we belong to God and have found in God our refuge and our safety and that nothing, not even death, can take God away from us. Now, an important pastoral note here. For some of us, choosing joy right now might be easier than others, um, might be harder than others. There can be many barriers that make choosing or finding joy harder. Mental illnesses, including depression or anxiety, the isolation that many of us feel due to COVID-19, especially those who live by themselves, economic insecurity, abusive relationships, chronic illness, and many other things can make it hard to find, cultivate, and share joy. And also for many of us, it, it, it bears being reminded that this is a particularly difficult time of year. There's less daylight, the nights are long and cold. Spending time outside is a little bit harder for those, especially those of us who depended on getting outside during those warmer months to temporarily break our, um, our confinement at home. And also many of us are observing the holidays either alone when, while we normally spend them with extended family. Um, that's a decision that Trisha and I decided um, was best for us and our family. This will be the first time in our, in our lives that we haven't spent Christmas and New Year's with our family. Um, and some of us are, are spending the holidays for the first time um, without loved ones who have died over the past year, either from COVID-19 or, or other causes. So just to put in a little plug here, we, we will give voice to all of these things and gather and express them um, when we gather on Monday, uh, December 21st at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Zoom for our longest night of the year service. Um, as I said earlier during the announcements, please note that's not gonna be a pre-recorded service, that's gonna be a live service on Zoom. Um, I felt that for the, the texture of that particular service, it would be best for us to do it live and to, to see one other uh, face to face if, if possible. And so, while we acknowledge the many obstacles that can make joy difficult, we're, never, we're nevertheless gathered today in front of a text that draws our attention to an unbridled joy found in the unlikeliest of places. You see, God could have chosen many other ways to be born in the flesh into this world. God could have chosen to be born into a ritzy family with a penthouse apartment in the hottest part of Jerusalem uh, with a vacation home on the Sea of Galilee. 
God could have chosen to be born into a wealthy family of some high-ranking general in the Roman army. God certainly could have made arrangements to make God's grand appearance in some fancy hotel or maybe the hospital with the, uh, the best maternity ward. But Jesus' birth looks nothing like any of those things. Instead, Jesus was born to a poor, brown-skinned, unwed, Jewish teenage girl named Mary. She was visited by the angel Gabriel, who informed her that God was going to make God's home right in her womb before making his worldly debut. And so in her exuberance, and probably not uh, without a healthy amount of nervousness, Mary decides to visit her much older cousin Elizabeth, who she's been informed is also pregnant, which is in and of itself a miracle. Uh, this child, Elizabeth's child, would be called John the Baptist. So when she arrives at her cousin's home, Mary greets her cousin and the child within her cousin's womb jumps for joy at the sound of her voice. Even in utero, it seems, John the Baptist can't help but point the way to Jesus Christ. And in this liminal moment, this moment when heaven and earth seem to be dancing with one another, Mary sings the song that you and I have come to know as the Magnificat, a spontaneous melody of unabashed joy and wonder. I sang my own version of the Magnificat this year. It was Saturday, June 6th of this year. To be precise, I sang it on the fourth floor of the North Tower at Central Baptist Hospital on a sunny day while gazing at the traffic going up and down Nicholasville Road. In my arms was my daughter, Hazel Grace. Uh, she was no more than 12 hours old. And it was the first time that she and I would ever be alone together. Trisha had finally found the energy to uh, get up and take a shower. So she left me and Hazel Grace alone for about 20 or so minutes. I held Hazel Grace and I sang. Even though I'm a hymn writer, I wasn't able to, uh, to write a poem off the top of my head like Mary did in today's passage, but I did sing a Magnificat. It just happens to be the hymn, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. So with tears streaming down my face, I gently sang this hymn and others to Hazel Grace overwhelmed by the capacity of God in an instant to turn my life upside down. So as I sang the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise and, and spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies, I felt perhaps the purest form of gratitude that I have ever felt in my entire life. Gratitude, wonder, and joy all important ingredients in a faithful Magnificat. So I wonder, I wonder if you've sung a Magnificat a time or two in your lifetime. A moment when you've just been overwhelmed by both, uh, by a sense of both how small and precious you are to a God who is bigger and stronger than anything you can even fathom. Mary's Magnificat is rooted in the faithful works of God, faithful works in the past that are being fulfilled in the present by the child within her womb, bearing creation on the path of God's redemption. This brown-skinned Jewish girl named Mary has the wisdom to know that this child within her was not business as usual. Even if she didn't know all the details yet, Mary knew that this child was going to be a continuation of things God already had been doing for a very long time. Scattering the proud, bringing down the powerful from their thrones, lifting up the lowly, filling the hungry with good things, and sending away the rich empty-handed. You see, this is a song of joy because of who is singing it. 
Coming from the lips of a poor girl like Mary, it comes out as a joyful magnificat. But those same words coming from the lips of a Roman general or maybe someone like Caesar or Pharaoh, well, from them it would be a lamentation. But that's just how Luke's gospel is, and it won't make any apologies for it. In Luke's gospel especially, Jesus Christ is the great role reverser who lifts up the lowly and gives those in high places a healthy dosage of humility, perhaps sending the rich away empty in order that they can fill themselves up again with better things than the belongings that weighed them down before. Mary sings with a particular type of joy that my seminary professor, Dr. Marcia Riggs, calls anticipatory joy. Anticipatory joy is a joy we express when we trust in the fruition of things that are yet to fully bloom. You know, it's worth noting that Mary's Magnificat isn't sung in a high palace. Mary's Magnificat is still sung by a girl without health insurance in a world where she has no rights because she's female. Mary's Magnificat is still sung by a girl who was born into a lower class family and will likely live the rest of her life in an economy that is designed to keep her there. And yet, she still sings and trusts that God's capacity for creation, for recreation, is bigger than, well, anything or anyone. Her joy is rooted in the fact that she feels growing within her, within her womb, the joy of a God who desires nothing more than the redemption of God's beloved, beautiful, flawed, and messy creation. It's anticipatory joy because it dreams into reality that which God has promised to do in our lives. Which brings us to today's theme from A Sanctified Art, Those Who Dream Sow Joy. Now to sow, that, that, that verb, it means to plant a seed, and seeds take time to grow. Seeds are, are fragile things, yes, um, but seeds are also resilient and surprising. Without seeds, we don't eat. Without seeds, we don't breathe. Without seeds, creation dies. Now, to sow joy means to plant a seed when you might not see the plant that it will grow into. To sow joy means to sing a song of justice in the midst of injustice. To sow joy means to sing the hymn, soon and very soon, when you don't see signs of the king coming anytime soon. To sow joy means to spend your entire life advocating for legislation that provides affordable health care to every person in this country, even if you don't live to see the day that it becomes a reality. To sow joy means to be relentless in our pursuit of peace and to dare to speak the words of the prophet Isaiah that proclaims that weapons will be turned into gardening tools even after we hear the news of the latest mass shooting. To sow joy means to teach your children kindness and respect and dignity, even when we don't see very much of it from the highest levels of leadership in this country. To sow joy means to wear a mask, even when you'll never know the people whose lives you may have saved by doing so. To sow joy means to trust that the way things are aren't the way things have to be. To sow joy means, well, it can be hard to describe it, but you know it when you see it. So I can show it to you right now. Uh, here's a video that was taken a few years back of the late John Lewis. It's a video one of his staffers took of him doing a silly dance to the, to the uh, Pharrell Williams song, Happy. Let's take a look at it right now. No, I'm, I'm full, I'm so full, I can't even move. Give me the paper. I'm so happy. <laughs> Go, Howard. I'm so 
Now, let me tell you why this is a version of the Magnificat. Let me tell you why this is an example of sowing joy. John Lewis fought his entire life for justice for everyone, but especially for persons of color in this country and around the world. He got into what he uh, termed good trouble his whole life, seeking the day when no person was denied the right to vote or lacked affordable health care or had to fear doing a mundane thing like going on a walk because of the color of their skin. John Lewis died this year, and he died before any of those things could become a full reality. He was arrested dozens of times, insulted, beaten, spit on, you name it. If anyone had the right to be bitter and cynical, it was John Lewis. But he wasn't. After all that, John Lewis retained the capacity for unabashed joy, goofy joy, silly joy, stubborn joy. And that inspires me, and it gives me hope. Because what people like John Lewis and others have taught us is that sometimes having joy like that is the best form of resistance to the powers that seek to divide us. Sometimes singing a song like Mary's or dancing a silly dance like John Lewis can be a powerful vaccine against many forms of evil. Such stubborn joy can inoculate us from the forces that seek to wear us down. Sometimes sowing seeds of joy is a choice that we make not because it is easy, but because it's our responsibility to the generations that will come after us. We sow seeds of joy not because it is convenient, but because it's the very lifeblood that keeps us going. We sow seeds of joy not because it is fashionable, but because we share joy with one another because God first found joy in us. And the only evidence we need that God finds joy in us is the baby growing in Mary's womb, the very reason for that first Magnificat. And so I want to encourage you, however you can, to sow joy. Be stubborn about it. Be creative with it. And be loud about it. Sow seeds of joy, not despite the difficult circumstances in which we find ourselves, but because of the difficult circumstances in which we find ourselves. Sow seeds of joy because doing so builds up emotional resiliency, and it allows us the capacity to endure such times. So, friends, don't be afraid to sing Mary's Alleluia and to join her in singing loudly, faithfully, and boldly our trust in God's capacity to turn things upside down and make things right in this world. I'll leave you this day with the words from another Mary, the legendary poet Mary Oliver. If you suddenly and unexpectedly feel joy, don't hesitate. Give in to it. There are plenty of lives and whole towns destroyed or about to be. We are not wise and not very often kind. 
and much can never be redeemed. Still, life has some possibility left. Perhaps this is its way of fighting back, that sometimes something happened better than all the riches or power in the world. It could be anything, but very likely you'll notice it in the instant when love begins. Anyway, that's often the case. Anyway, whatever it is, don't be afraid of its plenty. Joy is not made to be a crumb. Friends, in the name of God, the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, may all of us, God's beloved children, say, Amen. Great Creator, we are in awe of you. We will never know how you managed to dream up mountains and valleys, freckles, dimples, and curly hair, a cool morning mist, 
the change of seasons, or the magic of music. Your greatness is beyond our reckoning, and because we are in awe of you, we believe we must follow Mary's lead and allow our souls to sing. We believe the appropriate reaction to your goodness is complete gratitude, which looks like love for our neighbor, justice for the poor, food for the hungry, and joy that overflows. And even though we do not always believe in ourselves, we believe that our song is pleasing to you. We believe. Help our unbelief. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We come now, Holy One, into your presence. Bend your ear towards us, if you will, so that our prayers and supplications may be heard so that we can bring our deepest desires before you. We thank you for our lives, for the reconciliation and hope brought to us through Jesus Christ. We pray for the indigent, the homeless, those who are starving, those who are oppressed, and for those who hold them down. Let justice in this world prevail so that the work of all people who have lived and died and are living in the name of freedom and equality may be carried on and, if even we dare pray, ended in our lifetime. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those people known and unknown who are sick in body, mind, or spirit, for those with COVID-19, with mental illness, with cancer, with other illnesses, dealing with the uncertainty of not knowing what's wrong, for the addicted and recovering, and for those whose lives will not be long upon this earth. We pray for Danny and Melody Kazee as they continue to deal with the loss of their grandson we're grateful and ask for continuing recovery for Danny with his kidney transplant. Grant your healing and restoration upon each of them, your continued peace and strength for their journeys ahead. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for Sarah Hodges, the friends and families of Frances Reynolds, Beth Alexander on the loss of her Aunt Tilly, and the hundreds of thousands of others who have lost their loved ones, not only in this horrible pandemic, but overall. Give them a special sense of your presence, your peace and your strength. Dear Lord, please hear our prayer. We pray for our country and our leaders, for all who are in a position of authority over others. Grant to them moral and ethical decision-making clear sight and vision for a future filled with justice, hope, and freedom. Lord, we beg you, hear our prayer. For our children and the world's children, we give you thanks. May tears never drown out their laughter and may they grow into the fullest potential, showing your love, kindness, and grace. Lord, hear our prayers. Through Christ we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, how would be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On my own, what I have to give doesn't amount to much in the light of all I have been given and in the face of so much need. But put together as a congregation, what we offer here in love becomes more, not simply added together, but somehow multiplied in its usefulness. So let us give our tithes and offerings so that together with God's blessing, there might be enough for all.
How can we remember all your creation in this offering? You have given us time in the seasons. You have given us families and friends. You have given us our family of the church. Accept our offering of love. You give us the wonder and marvel of summer with the warmth and fun of faith. You give us the color and change of autumn and cause us to see the need for change. You give us the chill and rain of winter with time for us to sit and think. You give us the new life and growth of springtime with reminder of new life in Christ. Creator God, Lord of the universe, accept our gifts and our lives that the world and people may praise your name. Amen. Friends, we are so grateful that you could join us this day uh, for this worship service. Know that wherever you are, however you're watching this, whatever your circumstances, that you are loved uh, ferociously by us and loved even more ferociously by God. Now, uh, receive the benediction. Our benediction this day comes from uh, the Reverend Sarah R. As you go, may you have the strength to, to dream wild dreams of justice and peace 
and joy that overflows. May you have the humanity to listen to the dreams of others. May you have the confidence to trust that God who heard the cries of the Israelites in Egypt hears your dreams as well. And may you have the conviction to return to this space for our best dreams are those that we dream together. In the name of God, the original dreamer, Jesus, the dream come true, and the Holy Spirit, who enables us to be those who dream, go in peace and go in love. Amen.